Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Happy New Year. Use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. That's my favorite part, as you know. <laughs> well, not my favorite part. It's my favorite part of this part of an author talk, I guess. Tell us where you are. I'm in Seattle. Hetty is in New York. Anna is in London. Where are you? New York, Seattle. Seattle coming in strong at the beginning. I love it. Sometimes I have to wait a while. Portland, Halifax. Lovely. St. Paul. Welcome, welcome. We'll let a few people get tuned in and then we will get started. Chicago. Hello. Hi, Aaron. All right. Oh, and Aaron Goyaga. Hello. Hello, Seattle, and you're welcome. I'm delighted to be hosting. I'm going to give this just a few more minutes. Oh, it's cold in St. Paul. It is cold here, too, for Seattle standards. Not like last week, but it's been cold. Bend, Oregon, hello. All right, San Diego. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a bookshop here in Seattle, Washington that's called Book Larder. And we have just started to do a few in-person things again that we're now scaling back a little bit as we all sort of adjust to these curveballs that this virus continues to throw at us. Um, but we are continuing to do our author talks on Zoom and that allows us to do events like the one today where Anna, our author is in London, I'm here in Seattle and Hetty, our interviewer is in New York and you all get to tune in from everywhere. So thank you so much for being here. I cannot think of a better way to start the new year than with this really wonderful book, One Pot Pan Planet by the fabulous Anna Jones. We have been Anna Jones fans at Book Larder for a very, very, very long time. Um, she actually wrote a book for a brand in the UK many years ago um that i picked up and was like who is this person and so when she started actually publishing her own books i got very very excited and so um, i'm just delighted that she's here today we um are going to talk about the new book of course with hetty mckinnon she she will be doing the interview and hetty is also a longtime friend of book larder um and she is the author most recently of the book to asia with love she will talk with Anna about the book, and of course, we will leave time for questions at the end of the conversation. If you have questions, please use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask them, and um, we'll get to as many of those as we can. The talk is being recorded and will be posted to the Book Larder YouTube channel within the next day or so, and you'll also get a reminder email about that after the talk, too. And of course, you can support the talk uh, by purchasing your copy of one from Book Larder. I will drop a little link into the um, chat so that you can do that if you haven't done so already. And if you have, thank you so much. All right, we will get started then. Please join me in welcoming Hetty McKinnon and Anna Jones. Hi, Ron. Hello. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How hey, are you? Hetty. <laughs> How is everyone? Isn't this just miraculous? I mean, lots of strange things have come out of the last couple of years, but the fact that we get to kind of, you know, communicate, I chat, know. catch up, you it's know, amazing. be here with you all is, is really quite miraculous, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, like Anna and I haven't seen each other for years. We did do an event in New York. I don't know, I don't know what year that was, was 2017. So and um, we haven't seen each other really since then. So, you know, we haven't. No, we, we should be just it. catching up. But we're actually here today to talk about this, this talk about miracles, this miraculous book. <laughs> one, one pot pan planet that has a little bit of a ring to it. Congratulations. This book is absolutely beautiful and it's, quite a departure from your other books. Well, I think so. Maybe maybe you don't see it that way, but I think that, um, anyway, we'll talk about that, but how are you? <laughs> like yeah, the last I... two years has been 
it, it's been Quite a wild clear. old ride, hasn't it? But um, yeah. no, I feel very thankful to, you know, have, you know, all my family to be well, you know, I've been able to carry on working, even though I'm sure as was the same for you, Hetty, that kind of changed shape quite a few times <laughs> over the last yes. couple of years. Yeah. Um, and we were just, I was ju just, just saying before, I think that, you know, I, I think it's really, you know, sort of pulled focus for me on kind of what's important as it has for so, so, so many people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've just slowed down a bit really. And, 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 yeah. and sort of been spending a lot more time with family, um, and still working and still loving and enjoying my work, but I yes. think I'm just not pushing myself in the way that, yeah. you know, we all were before this, you know, it, 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 it was. It has shown you the different, the possibilities of mm. how this, this life can work. Um, did you start working on the book during the pandemic, before the pandemic? No, I'd written actually most of it kind of before. So, so right. we'd shot the whole book, luckily, before yeah. before everything kind of kicked off. Um, and I'd written most of the re well, I'd written all of re all of the recipes. Um, but obviously, when um, you know the world changed and shifted, I, I went actually back through the recipes yeah. and um, and kind of adapted and tweaked them. And um, I, I wrote lots of the other kind of essays and the kind of um, sustainability and, and, and planetary stuff. Um, yeah. you know, during the pandemic. And I think, you know, that really informed my writing on that because it's, you know, it was a different time, wasn't it? We've all changed yeah. how we cook. Um, yeah. I think for me, the value I put on food has, has, you know, it was already great. Obviously it's what I've built my, my career around just like mm. you, but I, I felt like it took on an even more importance kind of you know, value when we couldn't get flour, we couldn't get eggs. I don't yeah. know what it was like, you know, in Seattle. Oh, no, it was like or, that, yeah. yeah. Charlotte or St. Paul or Cape Town, all these miraculous places that people are joining us from. But um, yeah, in London, it you know, and it really, you know, just hammered home to me how important, you know, food is to me, but also how important all of those people who are part of the chain of getting, you know, that yeah. food from the field to my plate and how, you know, actually what a delicate process it is and how, you know, how every person and, you know, I think so often the food chain, it's such a kind of clinical term, isn't it? But mm. food is the opposite of clinical to me. And I think it, you know, I, I it made me really humanize that process much more and think about, you know, the person, obviously we've thought about the yeah. farmers, but the person, driving the truck, the person at the store, you know, it's, um, yeah. And it's amazing anyway. you wrote all of that kind of for prior to the pandemic. And then obviously when the, the pandemic happened, it became, as you say, so much more relevant. And I think that the world changed while we were in, while we were at home, the world completely changed in so many ways. Um, and I, I kind of see this book as a departure from, from your other three books because there is this huge sustainability angle. Um, and was that something that you were already kind of interested in after you wrote your, your previous book? I think it's, it's, it's something that I've kind of been, has been part of how I cook and how I live for, for, for quite a long time now. Um, you know, I became vegetarian about, you know, 12 years ago. And, you know, the initial reason I did that was, you know, kind of just as an experiment really but mm. you know every day that has gone by in those 12 years I've you know you know I, I think been more and more aware of the kind of you know the consciousness the sustainability um impact that that our diets have so um no it's definitely something that has been part of how I cook and how I live for a very long time um but I think when my first book came out which is so this is this is my fourth book my first book came out about eight or nine years ago and um I feel like the food landscape then was quite different I'm sure exactly the yeah, same for you Hetty, when, when your yeah. you know beautiful books were coming out filled with incredible you know vegetarian food I felt like there was a bit of persuading to do to mm -hmm. um, get people on board with a book you know a sort of modern book about vegetarian food so yeah I guess that was sort of my initial sort of barrier I guess and the initial thing I wanted to persuade people but you know as the you know lovely people who cook my recipes and buy my books you know they've kind of been on a journey with me and and mm -hmm. I was feeling from you know the way I get to sort of 
interact with people on social media or you know in the olden days when I actually used to meet people in real life <laughs> um you know that that actually you know lots of people have made the decision to eat vegan vegetarian you know either all the time or a couple of nights a week and actually you know a lot of people were wanting to know what else they could do the other decisions they could make you know beyond yeah. um you know making that swap a couple of times a week they just I think people wanted a bit more information and you know I and you gave it to them there's a lot of information <laughs> there is I mean, a lot of the, information the research is quite phenomenal like how did you go about doing that I mean did you is this things you already know did you have to go reach out and find experts in in their fields it, to help you yeah it was a mixture of stuff really um and I felt quite quite scared actually sitting mm. down to write it all the recipes come you know quite easily to me and yeah. not always quite easily sometimes you know I'll test something 10 11 12 times and not quite get it right but you know that format feels you know it feels like it's in my DNA I've been doing it for quite a long time but writing you know about sustainability and citing lots of different scientific surveys and you know I'm a real perfectionist and I wasn't going to do it unless I got it right so um I did a lot of the research and then I had a couple of really brilliant um uh climate kind of experts climate scientists kind of look over and check it all for me and you know suggest other other bits and bobs um but it was it was wading through quite a lot of scientific papers and quite a lot of stuff that um was out of my comfort zone really um but that's why I wanted to kind of distill it because yeah. I feel like I'm that person unless I was writing this book I wouldn't sit down and read scientific papers um but I want to know what I can do I want to know the changes that I can make and you know that's why I thought it was useful to have it in a cookbook because you know mm. my cookbooks are the place I go before I write a list of what I'm going to make or before I go to the store um so I, I, I think it's a much more digestible place of having, you know, some of this information, some of these reminders, some of these tips. And, you know, it's not heavy scientific stuff. It's, you know, ways we can waste less food ideas on, you know, how we might be able to support farmers and, you know, yeah. those kind of things. So, you know, for me, if I'm flicking through a cookbook and I'm reminded of that, you know, we all need reminders all the time. I do yeah. as much as the next person. So were you in the process of, adopting these I mean there's such amazing tips in here and it's if there's so much information and terms that we've often heard about um like low impact grains and we hear about them but what does that actually mean you know and mm -hmm. we hear about carbon footprint what does that actually mean so there's so much research in here and were you kind of incorporating these into your life as you were researching um or are they things that you'd already kind of taken steps I think quite a few things you know were already part of how I cook definitely the more simple things like you know the waste um you know I, I'm in a you know privileged privileged position in, in that I'm able to kind of make the decision to try and support some regenerative farms and buy mm -hmm. you know some produce from re regenerative agriculture I know not everyone is in that position both because of access and also because of budgets so there definitely was a, a lot of stuff I was already doing um, yes. but then there were some big you know points that, that I hadn't really thought about and one of the major um, things was was energy so I do I was always talking thinking about the kind of produce side of cooking and how you know we can have you know a lighter footprint in what we buy in what we throw away um but actually you know it doesn't sound very sexy but the energy we use when we cook you know it's, yeah. it's a third of the energy that we use in our houses and so you know that's what the kind of one pot pan tray came from because yeah I think lots of recipes encourage you to turn on, you know, especially super chefy ones, which, you know, yeah. are lovely, but they might encourage you to turn on like a broiler, like four hobs, an oven, yeah. a food processor. And I don't think we ever kind of budget that as part of, you know, the kind of, you know, the whole picture of a meal. I know this absolutely because I know when I'm recipe, when I'm heavily recipe testing, and I'm using, cause my oven is it's a gas top, but it's a, an electric um, yeah. oven inside. And I know because when I'm recipe testing, my bills go through the roof, my <laughs> energy bills go through the roof. And actually recently I bought um, a little countertop um, oven 
Mm-hmm. And now I use that if I'm at night and I'm just roasting vegetables, I'll just use that. I'll use it to bake cakes. It's amazing. And it doesn't have, because my stove is big, you know, my, yeah, cook, my yeah, stove yeah, is yeah, huge. Yeah. And it takes, it's one of those, it also puts the fan on after you've used it to, to cool it down. So it's literally on for hours. So I absolutely had never thought about that before, but um definitely I think that's uh that's something to yeah consider. yeah and it's fun it's, it's weird isn't it it's, it's so unsexy it's like who wants to think about their kind of power usage <laughs> when they cook but it's also the thing that can help everyone because I think so many parts of this sustainability conversation can be a bit elitist like it can mm. feel like oh well if I can't buy organic food or whatever I can't be part of this conversation but actually some of the swaps some of the changes that you can make are going to help every single household you know yeah. and I think so they're the ones that feel actually the most kind of exciting and the smartest in a lot of ways yeah so what are some like simple wine. oh you've got wine I've got it's, 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 eight, it's, it's 8 p.m here so I'm um, <laughs> yeah I'm having a little glass of wine cheers to you all <laughs> <laughs> cheers <laughs> I'm drinking buckwheat tea it's pretty good oh, it's like eating a, it's like eating a meal in a in, a, in liquid oh. form so what are some, let's break it down. What are some real simple tips that people could do on an everyday basis to be kinder to the environment? Well, the main thing, which you will know, Hetty, and I'm sure almost everyone on this, you know, on, on this, in, the, in this lovely little community we've got here tonight is, you know, not eating meat, fish and dairy as, you know, or really, really reducing those things. That is the single most impactful thing we can do. Um, And whether, you know, as I said, that means, you know, moving to a completely vegan lifestyle, which suits some people or just reducing what you can do, um, what, you know, reducing and and having a few plant-based meals a week. Um, The second thing is, you know, waste. Waste is definitely the second most impactful thing and in the book I've kind of laid out the 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 top 10 wasted foods they were really yeah. similar actually in the UK section. so they were in the US and I think quite often this conversation around food waste can be like oh you know chefs making carrot top pesto which is all well and good but actually the amount of people who buy carrots with carrot tops are very you know that's probably Mm. you can count that in the thousands so really you know to to make changes in food waste it's the bread you throw away it's the milk it's the bags of salad it's you know really really basic stuff Um, and so there's loads of ideas in the book for that and then um, I've also laid out the top 10 vegetables that we buy here in the UK and they were really similar in the US Um, and given sort of 10 really flexible recipes for those because I think um, I think that kind of flexible mindset in cooking is when you know we start wasting less I mean I love mm-hmm. people following my recipes but my ultimate aim really is that people will read you know my books your books you know the books of all these incredible food writers out there today and you know, and, and come away and just be empowered as cooks and be able to yeah. kind of, you know, riff and, Absolutely. you know, yeah. and, and use that last bit of broccoli, use, you know, those potatoes, use that leftover spaghetti. Um, so I think it's kind of empowering people to kind of step outside the recipe and be a bit more creative. Um, I mean, there's, there are so many, I, I could, I could sort of talk for an hour about tips, but I think the one main thing that I, feel is important to get across to people is that we don't need to be perfect in this we you know we don't need you know a couple of hundred thousand perfect sustainability vegan activists we need everyone in the world doing what they can making small repeatable changes and 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 I think so many people are put off because they think oh well I can't you know I can't you know, I don't have a compost bin or I can't yeah. do this part or this part, but actually the part, you know, we should just be celebrating the parts that we can do. Yeah. I think I say in the introduction, we make 35,000 decisions a day, yeah. <laughs> which is so nuts, isn't it? And obviously some of those are going to be like, you know, what underwear we put on or what, you know, whether yeah. we turn the light on or off, but you know, a good amount of those are going to be around food. So I think mm-hmm. if we think of it as waking up every day with so many opportunities for positive change, that's kind of how, you know, I like to, I like yeah. to think of it. Yeah. It's like when people, cause people ask me a lot about, Oh, how do I go 
be a vegetarian? Like, how, how, what are the steps to that? And I'm like, you know what? It's honestly just having one or two extra vegetarian meals a week. Um, maybe just having one a week to start with. It's mm-hmm. it's like that, you know, I think the, the flexitarian ideology is is quite a good one to start with um, because it's, it's um, flexible and it lets you kind of build it into your lifestyle slowly. And, and, and you know, when you're talking about guilt, it's one of the, the things that actually stops people from making positive change. So um, that's why I think the tips are so wonderful. And in terms of like, I love that, I think you talk about building a, a sustainable pantry. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about because I noticed, I mean, I'm a total canned legume girl (laughs) because I never remember to soak beans I have like plenty of dried beans in my pantry but I just never so I always forget to soak um but I always have you know the canned beans in my in my pantry ready to go and I was I was interested in that and kind of pertaining to the point where you talk about um carbon footprint and how tomatoes that are grown in the UK in a greenhouse um have a at a higher carbon footprint than say tomatoes from Spain so I was wondering that I mean that's part of the question and then the second part is are actually canned beans better than dried beans considering the cost (laughs) of our energy (laughs) well yeah it's so it's so difficult and I think like everything you know that is sort of you know backed by scientific studies there's always you know differing opinions um and I think that's what can feel quite difficult you know in, in terms of kind of food miles and making sustainable decisions because actually you know here in the UK you would assume that the you know tomatoes grown mm. here in the Isle of Wight would be the most sustainable choice but actually you know buying Italian tomatoes that are grown in the sun and don't use as much power but come to us by road um you know is often a smarter choice and you know, in the book, I just try and sort of talk a bit more widely about that. So, you know, um, you know, it, it's impossible to kind of, you know, write down every product and every vegetable and everything yeah. that people might buy, especially when, you know, the book so wonderfully are sold in a few different countries. Mm. Um, but just to kind of inform people and, and get them to think like, right, okay, do, do I think this came by road? Do I think this came by plane? you know, do I think if this was grown in the UK at this point in the year, it would need lots of lights, lots of greenhouse, you know, lots of extra yeah. help to grow it. Um, and so I think tuning in to that kind of, you know, real seasonality can be can be really, really helpful to people. Um, so yeah, I think building a sustainable pantry, you know, most kind of canned, jarred, dry goods are going to come, even if they are from further afield, they are going to come on a boat. I also think it's about, you know, connecting with the absolute joy of the ingredients. If you love Mm. something so much that it brings you, you know, unbelievable joy um, and you know that it's, you know, flown in, then absolutely treat yourself to it now and again, but just know, know that it's, you know, know the kind of backstory. Um, And, you know, obviously no spices are grown in the UK. So we're bringing all of these things from Mm. abroad, but they are, I know that they're, you know, bought bought by road or bought by boat. So, you know, the impact is less. But the the smart the, the really interesting thing actually about, you know, the canned beans, which I love yeah. too, and I have to say <laughs> I forget to soak a lot. Um, I think it's just also like having kids running around. It's like thinking mm. about dinner the day before. I, I quite often think about what we're going to eat about 45 minutes before. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. But every time I see somebody soaking beans on Instagram, I just feel so guilty. Like, yeah. Well, just, I do, you know. I, yeah, I do it occasionally <laughs> and I feel really smug about myself. But yeah. um, I it, actually quite often the, um, you know, when things are cooked on an industrial scale like that Mm. they you know the carbon footprint actually in most cases is less because you haven't got you know that they've been cooked in these enormous vats and you haven't got you know I don't know I don't know how many people but 10,000 people turning on their stoves and cooking them individually so I was hoping you'd say so Hetty, you're doing the world an enormous favor by not soaking your beans I knew it I just knew it (laughs) Oh, and like, um, and I'm, so, I'm so happy you talked about salad greens in the book because I feel like that's one of the things that 
just gets so much of it gets wasted because mm. there's I mean in the US they're usually sold in either bags or the, the plastic clamshells which really just don't keep them fresh at mm. all I mean mm. sometimes by the time you get home they're like already sweating and and gone rotten um how do you do you have a tip on how to keep those fresh well yeah the, 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 those little bags are usually packed yeah. with gas that keeps them fresh so as soon as you open the bag the gas escapes and they immediately start you know breaking down so um yeah I I will I wash them and then you know depending on the greens if they're slightly more robust salad leaves I'll put them in like a a container with you know a, a clean kind of dishcloth at the bottom yeah. and if you put them you know, I spin them dry, but I keep a little bit of moisture on them. And if you keep a little bit of moisture on them, that seems to help them kind of crisp and actually stay yeah. fresh. Um, yeah. You don't want them soggy, but just just a few droplets of water. Um, and then if it's anything like sort of watercress, rocket, anything that is, you know, that does, you know, go off really quickly, then keeping that actually in water in your fridge, I think will give it an extra, you know, that will give it an extra few days. And I often often do that but if you know if it's gone you know even you know, obviously if it's gone way too far but if it's just softened a bit and is beyond salad you know those greens are always amazing in kind of pestos they're amazing yeah. you know Soups. thrown yeah. in you know to, to a vegetable saute or a stir fry or a soup yeah. so I think yeah. if we sort of change our thinking around those lettuces as actually things that can be cooked around you know that that at like greens or cabbages then yes. you know we wouldn't throw them away so often yeah I mean lettuce um I grew up only eating cooked lettuce did you so it was like this I think I was a late teenager by the time um yeah I tasted raw lettuce so uh, yeah. yeah in Chinese yeah. culture we cook lettuce and it's the best it's so delicious yes yeah, so. so delicious um, yeah how funny I love yeah. that I love that <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of revelations when I was a teenager. Um, so let's talk about what are your, everyone always loves asking me the question, what are your favorite recipes in the book? Oh, well, that's do you have any? I, I, you know, I do. Um, there are a few that I have made again and again and again. There is a, a Sargaloo shepherd's pie, which. Oh, I was almost going to make that tonight. It's, I was it's, thinking it's, of it. It's always quite difficult to know, I guess, what books, what recipes are really going to fly in a book. And sometimes it kind of takes me by surprise. And actually, the recipes that have really connected with people from my last three books have kind of really informed how I wrote this book. Um, oh, but the, so know, which the, recipes have um, been the, the kind of the viral ones since it's come out in the UK? Well, the, the, the Sargali Shepherd's Pie has has been, I think, probably the most cooked recipe um, just because That's it's, it, yeah, it is super, super comforting. It's a kind of Ramja masala base, which is basically, um, you know, beans, lots of spices, yeah. tomato, a very, very simple bean curry that that's then topped with you know a sort of hybrid of sargaloo and aloo gobi which obviously is potato spinach spinach um yes. and sorry potato spinach and cauliflower, cauliflower with loads yeah. and loads and loads of spice so it's kind of got um you know it's it's a real kind of british hybrid dish i get because guess because it's a bit like a shepherd's pie it's also yes. got all those you know lovely curry flavors that we are so used to eating and really feel part of our culture here in the UK now so um yeah that is yeah that's a massive favorite there's also um a turmeric kind of udon broth that I have been making an awful lot recently it's just a really 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 simple simple turmeric sort of broth with lots of ginger in and then udon noodles soup it's udon noodles dropped in um but that just has felt like the best thing to kind of have through the winter it's kind of slurpable yeah. it's really really um yeah it's it, it, it it's what I want to eat when I have a cold basically someone's here saying they hate yeah. canned beans sorry sherry um buy some jarred beans you can get great <laughs> jarred beans if you don't like canned beans um but yeah there's lots I mean the, there's there's a pasta bake with smoked paprika that my son loves my son is a notoriously um, selective eater. Sure, yes, say. I was going to ask you, how does he deal with your um, the recipes from your books? 
Yeah, I mean, he's getting better. He's getting better, but he is, he's got a very, he's got a very plain palate. And I have to say, I just really, I don't think I had sufficient sympathy for people who find flavor and um, overwhelming. I think I just thought, mm. oh, I could just get on with it. Not so much kids, but definitely adults when they were saying, yeah. oh, I don't like capers or I don't like yeah. this or I don't like that. I was just thinking, oh, you know, you're a grown up, come on. But, you know, cooking for Dylan and actually understanding for him how sensitive his palate is and how overwhelming he actually finds some flavors has made me kind of rethink that. Um, and so, so we, we try and always eat the same thing, but yeah. I definitely do a kind of version for Dylan that is a bit simpler, has got a bit less spice. Um, yeah. You know, and then and then we will we will kind of like have some additions add some more texture add some more crunch add some more spice um it's but it's so been challenging really, isn't it it's so it, challenging for parents I think it's 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 really for me it feels like a funny thing because it's that moment in the day isn't it where you know you kind of want to sit around with your family have some yeah. downtime you want to eat something delicious because it's kind of you know your lovely reward and family time mm. at the end of the day but um but you also you know want you, you don't want it to be stressful so you don't want to be you know having the pushback against you know new and crazy stuff so yeah how are your kids Hetty are they they're a bit older aren't they so they're older and it's definitely been a process but they're they've mm. always been um they're quite good with spices to be honest um but there's definitely things like my my middle child doesn't he's, he's very textural so he doesn't like anything slimy mm. so that will go from eggplant to mushrooms um also really repels the texture of cauliflower okay. which but he'll eat it in a soup he'll eat almost anything in soup form so, I mean, that was pretty much what my book family was about, was about finding the ways of eating the things that I mm. like to eat, mm. presenting it in a way that the children would eat. And in many ways, it was like, oh, less herbs, because I like yeah. basically yeah, eat a salad of herbs. <laughs> yeah. Salad of herbs on the top same, of every yeah. meal. And it's like scaling back that and just, you know, less, maybe not less spices, but different spices. Yeah. Um, but it is challenging because I would eat cauliflower every night if mm. um, he ate it, but he, we literally eat everything. We, I made a soup the other night and um, I had like celery in the base, obviously, and he could taste it. And he mm -hmm. said he ate it, but he said to me, "Would that had celery yeah, in it?" Yeah, so, um, yeah, <laughs> you have fairly advanced palates. Now, I was told by um, Charlotte Chardrux, who interviewed you for the, uh, the Street Journal, yeah, who I'm friendly with. She mentioned this incredible recipe, and she just was raving about it mm -hmm. for a very long time: um, a smoky rutabaga carbonara. Which oh yeah <laughs> just sounds divine look at that yeah, yeah it's how, kind what of... are the mechanics of this how do you make rutabaga into well, and do you call rutabaga a sweet i call it we a call sweet. it yeah. yeah yeah we call it swede but i think rutabaga i mean such a good word isn't it, it? it's got it's, it's a really good word i feel like i'm just going to start using that and people are going to have no idea what i'm talking about over here um but yeah so i you know I'm not really one for kind of mimicking meat very often because mm. I think vegetables have such, you know, vibrancy and glory of their own. Um, but occasionally there are dishes that I kind of feel like I sort of miss eating. Now I don't eat, eat meat and it's obviously been a really long time since I have. Um, so yeah, I was trying to come up with something that I felt like would, you know, sort of take the place of those, you know, crispy, crunchy, smoky lardons. Um, and I think I was just frying up some Swede, added some maple syrup and, and, and some smoked salt, which I'm sure you can buy over in the US. Um, and it, they just went like kind of really crispy. They, they, they kind of take on flavor. They take on a glaze really well, Swedes mm. and rutabagas do. Um, and um, yeah, it just works. So it's kind of a classic carbonara, but you know, it's got that kind of smoky, crispy Swede kind of um, running through it. And um, yeah, yeah, it so really unusual. works. And actually, that is one of the ones that 
um dylan dylan willie he loves a car <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm gonna try um, that one but i think swede rutabaga i think it's a very kind of underused vegetable it's very you know we you know i make it into kind of in, into fries or you know into cut it up and roast it and it's you know it roasts up so beautifully um and it's just got a kind of sweetness, you know, much like a kind of squash or a parsnip or something like that. And I think, you know, it's one of those vegetables that just doesn't get any airtime. And I think it should. No. You've inspired me. I, I don't, can't remember the last time I cooked with um, a rutabaga or a swede. Just yeah, don't see them around that often. No, it's quite, so. a, I guess it is quite a British vegetable, but I have seen them, you know, a lot in the US. And I think, you know, often in, you know, if you get kind of, veg box or I don't know what they call like CSA yeah CSA, CSA boxes, yeah. boxes um you know quite often here you'll get a couple at the bottom of your box yeah you know yeah, yeah. okay yeah. well we all have to try the um <laughs> the the rutabaga carbonara because I've, mm. I've been told it's amazing um <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just going to remind people um there are some questions in the Q&A and I'm going to get to those but yeah, just um, pop your questions in the Q and A because I'll, I'll, depending on how many we get, I'll start, I'll start on the questions pretty soon. Um, so you know, like, what are you in in terms of just everyday life? Like, what what are you working on right now? Um, so I'm actually I'm doing a few different things. Um, I'm I'm actually starting on another book, which won't be out yeah. for a very long time. As you know, Hetty, um, mm -hmm. it takes a really long time, doesn't it, to get from kind of, you know, writing yeah. the first recipe to having having an actual book um, in your hands. Um, so I'm just, start, I'm just starting that kind of actually this week, which is really exciting. Amazing. Um, it's a good time to be starting a project like that yeah it is it is I sort of always end up sort of seeming to sort of start start new projects in January so um no it's really really nice it actually feels really exciting um I finished this book I finished writing this book a good while ago now obviously this came out in the U UK um you know eight or nine months ago so um yeah it feels it feels exciting and it feels a good time um I've actually been getting quite into doing some work with some um, children's food charities here in the UK, um, which has been really fun. One around, oh, um, one around taste. So, um, yeah, brilliant British journalist B Wilson, who you I'm oh, sure I you've love come across. I who, love if, if anyone here hasn't read B's books or read yeah. B's, you know, articles online, she is just the most smart in tune wonderful woman and she's she come is. up with this incredible concept called taste ed um which basically is a curriculum that she's designed with chefs and um you know and, and food writers and i've helped her a bit with it and she's going into schools we're going into schools and helping people with you know th their kind of sensory feelings around food mm. and, and kind of you know getting kids um you know just just to to, to kind of be near food react to food um yeah and, and definitely some some kids who you know don't have access to to lots of different you know um different types of food it's it's actually been really really interesting um so there's a bit of that I'm doing um yeah I'm doing doing lots of lots of different things I've got a course an online course which oh that's um, right. I yes. spent a good chunk of last year doing so that's that's happening um I've got some little meals actually some just just for January a lovely friend you of mine do. and I have collaborated together and um we've got some beautiful meals they're not available in the yes. US but they're over here so lots of lovely projects and lots of lovely Fine. ways of um you know yeah because you always start January with your vegan your health your health kick don't you well, yeah, it's more like a reset. So I feel like reset, it's sort that's of right. is that's the word, bit, reset. It is kind of a bit of a health kick, I guess. I just I don't always do it in January. Um, and I haven't done it this year yet, actually. I might do it. I still feel like it's sort of slightly the holidays. I don't really yeah. feel like it's January yet. <laughs> We're hanging um, somehow. on somehow. But I quite often do it in spring. And the main, re you know, it, it's a reset. So it's just really kind of simplifying the food I eat. It's still, you know, I still eat like three major meals a day. I'm, yeah. I'm not one forever kind of, um, yeah. 
I'm not one forever depriving myself. But I think, you know, like you, Hetty, sometimes when I'm testing recipes, when I'm thinking about food all the time, I kind of, you know, I just sometimes want a bit of a reset of my palate, you know? Yeah. I want to kind of simplify food, eat really simply, know what I'm eating, not think about it all the time. And that's that that's what yeah. I you know, the reset is just seven days where I do that basically. Um so yeah. The recipe testing is a it's an interesting experience because I think I mean we just were talking before we came on. I've just finished a book that's coming out in you know, so ages exciting. away. Yeah. Um, but it was a world that you inhabit, you know, both mm. in your kitchen and with your family because we eat everything I cook. Um, nothing mm. gets thrown away. And it is a world that, that, and you're eating these foods and these flavours because, you know, every book is a story. And so mm. these, these, mm-hmm. these flavours are kind of consistent. And then at the end, you kind of just go, ah, I can eat something else now. Yeah. I can... <laughs> I can eat pasta with red sauce. Like Absolutely. <laughs> and it's just that relief sometimes to be like, I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to have like pasta with cheese or something, you know. Yeah, it's, and, and, and it's, a meal it's, that I haven't thought about. Yeah, constantly. it's the best job in the world. I, I really, like, I love doing what I do. It is the best job in the world. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's nice not to think about like, oh, does this need a bit more lime? Does this need some more yes. sesame seeds? Does this need a bit more chipotle? It's nice just to sit down and think, this is just a plate of pasta. <laughs> exactly. I mean, now that I'm kind of, I, I finished testing, what the meals that I cook most nights are not really recipes. They're just like mm. things that I, like the other night I went and bought like gnocchi and I bought a sauce and then I had a pile of kale in the fridge and I had this half balls of mozzarella. And so I just kind of like threw it all in a pan and yeah. stuck it in the oven. And then, like, you know, kids like, kids loved it, thought it was delicious. Uh, and, like, I'm not recipe testing. Um, it's winter. So like, what, what are some of the meals that you, what are you eating in January oh. in, in the UK? Oh, I know yeah. how the person January in the UK is. Well, yeah, it's like, <laughs> at the moment, we're just in that, we're just getting towards that kind of bit of the year where, you know, we've been excited about kind of holiday food. Yes. Everyone's eating all the root vegetables that they can take <laughs> and everyone wants something a bit fresh. And and there are some great things. There's like Italian radicchio and all those lovely, you know, bitter yes. lettuces. And there's still lots of lovely citrus around, but there isn't anything kind of fresh and exciting. Um, yes. So it's definitely that point in the year where, um, you know, where I think spice and, you know, yeah. um, spice and kind of freshness from kind of citrus and things like tamarind and um yes. you know those kind of like slightly acidic flavors like t- tonight we had like a like a rendang curry yeah. with coconut milk and and loads yeah, of tamarind so good. and um you know that so 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 that kind of thing um but also in in winter i kind of crave you know pastas like you know i i I will never stop loving like a really good puttanesca pasta. You know, mm-hmm. I, I make it without the anchovies, but with olives, capers, yes. you know, really unctuous tomato sauce, loads of olive oil. I just, you know, I think there's almost not a better thing to eat. And sometimes I'm like, why am I writing these recipes? I should just write a puttanesca book. This you is. should. All, all the way to puttanesca with yeah. rutabaga. I'm sure you could do one with rutabaga. Yeah, let's get it in there. <laughs> Completely agree with you. And for those people who don't know this book, I think every recipe has like a vegan substitute. And that's yeah. that's a first for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, so most of my books I've really tried to give lots and lots of vegan alternatives. My brother and sister are both vegan, so it's kind of just part of how I cook anyway. Yeah. Um, but this one I've tried to give a kind of almost like a choose your own adventure. So mm. each recipe can go either vegan or vegetarian. There are a couple, and most of the time that's just with some substitutes. There's a couple of recipes where I've had to kind of write sort of two different yes. methods. Yes. And then there was, I think there's one recipe that I couldn't, I couldn't veganize because it was a honey oh, cake. Really? Um, oh right and yes. I just couldn't I tried agave I tried maple I tried lots of other things and it just you know the stickiness that honey takes on when it's been roasted just I, I just couldn't replicate with anything else so I that was my kind of you know white flag I was like sorry <laughs> yeah um, that looks good but yeah I, that was I actually that. felt really important to me because I feel you know 
I like I like everyone around the table to be to, to be able to eat you know a meal and and I know lots of families now there's a combination of vegetarians and vegans yeah and, you know that's the honey oh cake. the honey cake yeah oh, and, and it looks so good I'm you know whilst I do eat a bit of cheese I do eat you know eggs occasionally I would say we're about sort of 95% plant-based in this house anyway so mm. you know I'm making you know I don't you know I'll use a vegan kind of feta alternative instead of feta cheese you know most of the time so you know it's very much how I cook as well yeah I'm kind of the same actually I, I, I haven't really strongly started veganizing recipes but on a day-to-day -day basis I drink oat milk um I don't really mm. eat that much cheese anymore, strangely enough, but I'm going to get to the questions. So, oh, yes, um, yes because there's quite a few here. Um, so the first question is, um, I really struggle with making sauces and adding flavor to vegetables. I would just roast veggies and or saute with oil, salt and pepper. Any suggestions or on ways to easily add flavor with not a lot of ingredients? Um. Well, I'm sure you will have loads of answers here as well, Hetty. So feel free to chime in. It's it's two for the price of one. We, we <laughs> yeah. So um yeah um, but I would say what I think are really really smart are spice blends. Um, you can buy some incredible spice blends nowadays. You know, if you can from sort of small uh, spice producers. Um, but also lots of the bigger stores stock them. Things like, you know, Ras Al Hanout, which is like a Moroccan spice blend, um, you know, Zata, Zata um, yeah. yeah, like lots of Harissa. different kind of, yeah, Harissa, lots and lots of different kind of curry blends. We have loads and loads of different ones available here in the UK, but, you know, even just a curry powder, a garam masala. Yeah. Um, and I think for people who don't want to get, you know, six or seven jars out of their pantry when they're cooking, you know, those spice blends are really, really, really useful. I use them myself, even if, you know, you do have all the spices and you have 20 minutes one afternoon to, to make up one of your own. I mean, even better. Um, yeah. But I think they're a really great way of adding spice quickly. And Harissa, you mentioned there, I think, you know, lots of these ambient, you know, lots of these kind of pastes and jars that we can, mm -hmm. you know, live first of all in the pantry, but then once open, live in the fridge, like miso, yeah. Harissa, um, um, I'm trying to think of other things, but yeah, chipotle paste or chipotles yeah. in adobo, those kind of things. Um, you can just take a teaspoon out and then it goes back in your jar and it will live there for another yeah. couple of months. I think we're living in a really kind of lucky culinary age because there are so many wonderful, you know, family owned brands making um, really like spice blends, wonderful spice blends I mean, in the US. Yeah. We're your friends, really is, it, is it NY Shook? And New York Shook. I mean, they oh, I are love constantly those guys. expanding yeah. their, their spice range. And I almost don't roast a vegetable without some sort of spice blend yeah. on it because it's free flavor, it's fast flavor. Things like chili oil, like if people think yes. of chili oil as just spice, but chili oil, you know, the, the good commercial ones have, um, or homemade. Um, have so much layers of flavor in there that it just transforms vegetables. So, mm. I, I mean, it, right now, eating roasted vegetables is basically what I eat every night. Um, <laughs> it is. I'm, I'm going yeah. through this phase where it's all I want to eat. And one thing I have been doing, which has been really fun, is I make this basic tahini sauce at the start of the week, which yes. is just like tahini you know, water to get it to the right consistency yeah. and, and garlic and lemon. And then during the week, I'll add things to it. And yeah, so nice. it's like a never ending tahini sauce. So I'll get yeah. bored because I get bored really quickly. So then I'll add some chili paste, some preserved mm. lemon, some, mm -hmm. I don't know, some whatever spices I've got lying around. And it, it changes the whole week. And so you're kind of eating the same thing, roasted vegetables, but you're getting something different every yeah. night. So yeah, love um, that. Anyway, so I hope we've answered that question. <laughs> um, okay, which recipes were the most difficult to develop? Uh, well, there's always a couple in every book, aren't there? And all my recipes, I'm sure, same with you, had to get tested a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually send mine out to, I have someone who's a professional recipe tester who tests them. And then I also send them out to a friend who's not a cook because I feel yeah. like, I need someone who yep. isn't, you know, thinking professionally about it. Um, 
Uh, but some of them, some of them, you know, sort of get into double digits and that's when you know it's a tricky recipe. Yeah. Um, and actually veganizing some of the recipes in this book were, were I guess, was one of the big challenges. Um, I wanted to, to, to veganize all the cakes, but I didn't want to kind of use any, I just can't be bothered to ask people to buy like xanthan gum or whatever else. Yeah. They're very useful products and they're brilliant. Um, but I know for most people, it's gonna be something that, you know, that puts them off. And actually we, you know, after loads and loads and loads and loads of tests, we realized that sparkling water, kind of fizzy water and a little bit extra bicarb, um, actually gave an amazing rise in in all of the cakes um so I think that was on like our 15th try and we just gave it a whirl with with fizzy water and thought this is never going to work but they came out great they came out lighter I actually prefer them to the ones with eggs in so um yeah so wow yeah. so great yeah that was there. that was quite a revelation um and sometimes those ones that are difficult to develop really force you to discover something good yes I love that. That's a great tip. Um, so what else? Somebody's asked to ask about your Welsh cakes. Mm. Is that something separate to this book or is it in the no, book? No, no, no. So there's some Welsh cakes in the book. So I'm oh, Welsh. Okay. Well, I'm originally, my dad's Welsh. My husband's Welsh. Um, uh -huh. He's proper Welsh. He can speak Welsh and everything. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of like sort of fake Welsh. But um, so, 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 so there's a lot of kind of Welsh heritage in our, in our household. Um, and one tradition we have every St. David's Day, which is he's the patron saint of Wales. I make Welsh cakes with my son. Um, so nice. But every time I eat a Welsh cake, so Welsh cakes, these little kind of almost griddle cakes with, um, you know, with sultanas in, um, they've okay. got coated sugar on the outside. Um, a bit like a kind of very flat, somewhere between a scone and a pancake, if you haven't uh -huh. had it before. And every time I ate them, they're very sweet. I really, because they're buttery, oh, they're crumbly. They I really, really wanted something savory in them. So a savory um, Welsh cake. So Which they're savory way Welsh more, cakes. Way up my alley. Yeah, I'm not sure how my Welsh ancestors will feel about it, but you know, I think that'll be fine. Um, so they've got dill in, they've got um, they've got green olives in, um, they've got some cheese in. So they're kind of and what is great about them is you cook them like pancakes. So they're a minute on each oh, side. Wow. But so so you know if you've got you know if you want to make something for people coming round or you know just you know just something for yourself because it's been two years of craziness <laughs> yes they come together really quickly so yeah I love them okay great I'm gonna try that and I've never tried that before um Vereen hi Vereen Vereen Martin has asked what was the most surprising thing or useful thing you learned or discovered when developing recipes for one relating to sustainability ingredients or anything oh love that yeah um, so I think one of the most surprising things I realized was really like honing down on simplicity. There was a whole chapter that was supposed to go in this book that was kind of feast food. Mm -hmm. And we decided not to put the entire chapter in, in the end, just because yeah. I sort of felt like I wanted this book to feel simple. I wanted it to feel like, you know, achievable kind of weeknight dinners um and I wanted that satisfaction of being able to throw everything in one pan and feel like you know the recipes were kind of you know easy on effort easy on washing up all of those things so I think that's one of the things that I have I think discovered over the years of writing recipes is actually you can want to do something crazy and fancy with kind of you know a, a, a wild ingredient no one's ever heard of and a crazy technique but actually the recipes that are going to be useful to people are the really simple ones with really accessible ingredients so it's just I think it's just always reminding myself of that. Yeah that's great. Um, Chris would like to know who are the people who have influenced your food journey? Oh, I love questions like this. But that is such a good question. It's, and I just think hard. we're living in such <laughs> a rich time, aren't we? For food we writing, for recipe writing, for kind of the way in which we kind of consume food and food media. So I feel really, really lucky to be, to be, you know, writing and reading about food now, actually. Um, mm. 
you know, he's influenced my food journey. I would be completely remiss if I didn't mention Jamie Oliver. I worked him mm-hmm. for him for seven years and he was a big part of kind of building, I guess, my, um, yeah, my, how I think about food, how I think about yeah. recipe writing um, and also how I think about kind of accessibility. Um, I've always, I mean, the person's recipes that I cooked first was Nigella. Um, Mm -hmm. you know her her domestic goddess book and how to eat I was kind of cooking them when I was 11 or 12 and and she actually really represented something for me that I didn't feel like existed there weren't really any other kind of women um, that I associated with you know talking about food Um, so she really let a spark Um, I mean Nigel Slater what a guy I mean he's just a food poet my favorite too he Um, is I, and, and two other people who are over on your side of the Atlantic, Heidi Swanson, who oh, writes yes. the blog 101 Cookbooks. I just think she's an absolute OG. She's just she incredible. She really is. She's amazing. I adore her. Love her. Um, and Sarah Britton, who writes My New Roots um, mm-hmm. up in Canada. I just think, you know, she's smart. I really trust what she says around kind of nutrition because she's got the kind of knowledge and, and, and the qualifications and I love her. So, yeah. Thank you. And then Pam wants to know, I guess, kind of a perfect next question. Recent cookbooks that you love and food writers that you love. I guess you've already mentioned food writers. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at my stack of cookbooks over here and thinking of the ones um, that I um, have cooked a lot from. I'm not just saying this, but Hetty, your book has been cooked from a lot over here and I'm a big fan of it. Um, there is, uh, there's uh, the, actually the Ottolenghi Shelf Love, Ottolenghi Test Kitchen oh, Shelf that's Love a wonderful book, book. Yes, um, yeah. which I have cooked from an awful lot. Um, I've been doing a lot of baking from um, Wild Sweetness by Talia. Oh, Talia Ho, yeah. Talia Ho. Um, she has got some really, really good cookie recipes. Um, so I have been um, looking into that. I've been enjoying Heidi's latest, well, her, not actually that recent Supernatural Simple, which I really, mm-hmm. really love. Um, Nigel's A Cook's Book, which I think is all I haven't out got in that the one yet. Well. I'm looking oh forward God. to that. It's so beautiful. It's got this kind of yeah. brush stroke, pink yes. and yellow cover. Um, and even though it's, you know, there's a lot of meat in there and, you know, a lot of the recipes I'm not going to yeah. cook, it just... It just feels like a sort of comforting companion. <laughs> yes. Oh, all his books are. They're amazing. Now, mm. I've got a lot of questions. I'm going to kind of scoot down. Um, Aaron, our friend Aaron the Yoga, would like to Hi, know. And I, 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 I want to know, know the answer to this too. So I'm going to ask, uh, how sustainable or unsustainable do you both see egg consumption? As a GF baker, leaning towards plant-based baking, I'm always struggling with this. Yeah, I I'll let you answer that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really really tricky one I think. Um in all honesty, I think I would like to move away from eating lots of eggs. Um mm-hmm. I do try and seek out eggs from, you know, responsible farms, small farms, but that's not always possible, you know. I can buy them from my farmers market if something's happening that weekend and I don't get yeah. there or whatever. Um I I think, you know, it's a really, really tricky one. Um, uh, And so I think, you know, I know there are going to be people who always want to make cakes with eggs. So in lots of my recipes, I give that option. Um, But I think if you can get just as good a cake using something like, you know, a flax seed or the fizzy water that we talked about earlier, then why not try and um, do that but there are definitely still some sticking points and things where you know I haven't been able to replace eggs or or find an alternative so yeah it's definitely it's definitely a work in progress and I think you know even even the organic you know traceable eggs here in the UK I still you know I still don't feel a hundred percent comfortable about buying yeah it's just I think I, I probably agree with everything you just said and it's just a matter of doing less with eggs I think Mm, mm. um okay it's 359 I think we might have a question for time for one more question um this is from Lexi Bloom our friend Lexi Bloom she says we end up using way too many dishes when we cook 
absolutely agree with this. Um, any tips, environmental, economical, to not use every pot or knife around? Yeah, well, I think it's actually a really good thing to kind of get out what you're going to use for your recipe at the beginning, because I'm the same. I might want to yeah. use like three mixing bowls or, you know, four knives or two peelers or whatever. Um, but, you know, if you just have a little kit out that you know you're going to use for that recipe, then I think that helps you um, limit things. I think also just, um, you know, also sort of, I think not, I think it's the same consumerist culture we have around food, we have around clothes, you know, we can have our kitchens full of loads and loads and loads of equipment. Um, and actually, we, we just, we renovated our house a little while ago. And so I, I got rid of like half of the stuff in my kitchen, mm -hmm. because I realized actually, you know, it just ended up clogging up my cupboards and being, you know, you know, I didn't need 20 pans. I really needed yeah. like four good pans. Um, so I actually think kind of, you know, really like trying to streamline the stuff you have as well is a yes. really good way of making sure of that. And, you know, rather than buying four pans, you know, perhaps saving up for that one great pan that's still yes. going to be with you when you're 80 years old. I um, really agree with that. I really agree with that. One thing that I did recently, and I know we're out of time, um, <laughs> but I got a, I got a caddy for the um, a countertop. Mine's by Material Kitchen. And it has your basics, your basic knives, your yeah. spatula, your tongs. And it's basically yeah. like everything you need. And it's amazing. It revolutionizes the way you think about cooking yeah. equipment because mm. you don't really need to open your drawer because yeah. it's all there in the caddy. But anyway, yeah. I'm going to hand I've it got, over to I've Lara. got mine behind me there, except it's a jug. <laughs> I, I, I need yeah. to get myself a caddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Hetty and Anna. This was so great. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Anna, congratulations on the book. It really is just so wonderful. And I think um, just the perfect thing to sort of settle into at the beginning of the year and plan out all the things you wanna make and just enjoy it, you know, as you go through the seasons, um, it's really great. Yeah. Yeah, and we recorded this. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, like I said, it'll be on our YouTube channel. And so you'll get a link to that afterwards that anyone can watch. And oh, one thing I have to say, Hetty, you mentioned Charlotte Druckmann. Charlotte and I were DMing last night and we have a <laughs> of, of the two of you in some kind of like transatlantic column in a major newspaper situation. I think we need to make this happen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would okay. love that. that Anything that involves you guys and Charlotte. I mean, absolute <laughs> dream scenario. Dream scenario. I love um, I love that you you guys sorted that out, Lara. Oh, we did. Yeah, we planned your entire like at least next five years. It's. I think there's you. nothing the two of you couldn't do when you put your heads together. <laughs> All right, thank you both of you. Hetty had a have a great afternoon, and Anna get some sleep. Have a good evening. I hope uh, you're going to bed soon too. Oh, uh, what a pleasure! Thank you so thank much. You much for me. And here. hopefully in Seattle in person Yay. soon sometime. See you soon. See you soon. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye.